Yes, we can see them. Okay. I'm just going to introduce them. Okay. I'll wait. Yes. I'll wait a minute. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming join us. We're going to start right now at 12 o'clock. So please welcome Dr. Hansen, distinguished professor of the University of Florida. Dr. Hansen joined the faculty at Florida as an assistant professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine in 1984 and transferred to the Dairy Science Department, now Animal Science in 1986. His formal education was at the University of Illinois and University of Wisconsin. He received postdoctoral training in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Florida. As a faculty member at Florida, has been identifying embryo kinds that regulate development of the pre-implantation embryo, demonstrating sex-dependent development programming during the pre-implantation period, understanding how elevated temperature compromises reproduction, development of embryo transfer to increase pregnancy rate in its stress cows, demonstration of the importance of the sleep mutation in the prolactin receptor gene for increasing thermal tolerance of cattle and characterization of mechanisms for inhibition of uterine immune function by progesterone. So thank you so much in name of ASGSA. Thank you for giving this talk. Thank you, Camila. Thanks very much. I love talking about this topic. So it's, it's a great pleasure to discuss how to achieve success in academia. Couple of caveats. I'm gonna talk how to su achieve success as a researcher in academia. There's obviously other aspects of academia besides research. I have the most experience with uh, research, so that's what I'm gonna discuss. Also, at most of the major universities involved in animal science, most positions are either research teaching or research extension. So uh, success in a research career is important for uh, most of the kind of positions you'll see in animal sciences. So the other caveat is there's more than one way to skin a cat, as we would say in the United States. There's more than one pathway to success. So everything I tell you, these are just my opinions. I'm sure there's other ways uh, to be successful in science uh, besides uh, what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm starting off with this slide. I love this cartoon. Cupid going into a lab, making all the postdocs fall in love with their research. That is the secret to success as a researcher in academia, is to love what you're doing. If you don't love it, I think it is hard to be successful in it. Just like that would be true for anything. If you don't love playing basketball, it's probably hard to be a NBA basketball star. If you don't love research, it's hard to really be successful in it. This is a photograph. I know Bill Thatcher is in the Zoom audience. He'll recognize Jim Lauderdale. Bill and Jim were grad students at the same time. Dr. Lauderdale got his PhD in the same lab as I did at Wisconsin. He's the guy who discovered Lutalize. For those of you who work in uh, reproductive biology. And he, he had a very successful career at Upjohn at Pfizer, and he's still active as a... Uh, no. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we got a bunch of unmuted microphones out there in Zoom world. Can't change the answer. No, it is. This is the one showing. Right? Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. So what are people seeing in Zoom? Are they seeing Jim Lauderdale or are they seeing the next one? We're seeing Jim Lauderdale, Dr. Hansen. Well, that's good. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm shooting for. 
So Jim told me one time that he used to think he was a very hard worker because he was working at Upjohn every night after dinner, he'd go back into the lab every Saturday and Sunday, he'd go back into the lab. And he always thought that one of his characteristics was he was a very hard worker. Please turn off your microphones, people in Zoom land. See, I think there's a way for me to do that. I don't know how, though. Yeah, yeah I think they're all off. So then he got promoted into management. And after about six months or so, he realized he wasn't coming in at night anymore. He wasn't working on weekends anymore. And he realized I was never a hard worker. I just loved what I was doing. And so I did it whenever I could. But once I had a job I didn't love anymore, my work habits changed. And I think that's a good lesson about the importance of uh, loving what you do. I mean, these are the people who were kind of cupids for me, who kind of lit the fire for research for me. Phil Jacques was the very first animal scientist I got exposed to as an undergrad at Illinois. You can see he's kind of a showman. And he really inspired me to uh, love reproductive biology. And when I was an undergrad, I started doing research projects with Chuck Graves, who was like a very kind, patient man, who spent hours with me talking about our experiments, talking about our results. And, you know, he lit the fire of reproductive biology for me. And Ed Hauser was my major professor for my master's and PhD degree. He was also an outstanding teacher of graduate students. And he really had. Uh, very noble views of uh, the value of research. And he imparted that to his students. So these are the guys who inspired me uh, to become a researcher. So one thing I would encourage all of you while you're in grad school. Oh, thank you. The problem is we got about three different modes here. If you don't mind, I can be next to you in here, like just changing it because this is the one that I showed you. Ah, okay. All right, I see. Okay. So those were the three guys I was talking about that you couldn't see in the room. And then, um, so when you're in grad school, you're going to learn the techniques of being a scientist, right? You're going to learn how to design an experiment. You're going to learn how to weigh pigs. You're going to learn how to run a balance. All that's very important, but I'd also encourage you while you're in grad school to really find out what it is that, that you love to do. You know, what is your passion? What do you love doing? What do you hate doing? If you hate reading, if you hate writing, if you don't like coming in on the weekends, you know, is an academic career as a research really, as a researcher, really what you want to do? Or is there something else that motivates you? You know, I'd encourage you while you're uh, in graduate school to find that out. And this is a image that I find really funny, how people at different levels of science see each other. Like the undergrad correctly sees a professor as God. <laughs> a postdoc sees a professor as somebody spying on them, I suppose. Professors see themselves as winning the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but you know, really, life as a grad student, life as a professor is not that much different. You know, you think as a grad student, I'm a slave and my professor has it so easy. But basically, professors do the same thing in, in uh, their career as do um, uh, 
Let's see. As as do grad students, right? Professors work long hours, not just grad students. Professors get rejected all the time. Our grants get rejected, our papers get rejected, just like for grad students. Professors get criticized, just like grad students. They get criticized by different people and probably in a different way. And sometimes the consequences are more severe because maybe they don't get tenure because they're uh, not proceeding in a correct way. This is the Journal of Universal Rejection. And they say it has a lot of uh, advantages. You can send your manuscript here without suffering waves of anxiety because you know with 100% certainty your paper will not be accepted for publication. <laughs> and you can claim to have submitted your paper to the most prestigious journal based on acceptance rate, which is zero. <laughs> so it's a badge of honor to send your paper to the Journal of uh, Universal Rejection. You know, there's one, oh, sorry about this. There's one other thing to realize about graduate school. Some of you probably wanted to be veterinarians. Some of you might've wanted to be medical doctors. You know, it's really hard to get into vet school. It's really hard to get into medical school. But once you're in, your career is set. And everybody gets a job after they become an MD or a DVM. But graduate school is kind of the opposite. It's a lot easier to get into graduate school than into some professional schools. But achieving success afterwards isn't guaranteed. You know, I was for this talk, I was just looking at some statistics across all disciplines, and I think animal science is higher. You know, maybe 10 to 20% of PhDs go into academic positions. So most end up not going into academia. And it can be a very frustrating process. This is a tweet from some woman who's kind of ticked off at all the people who paid no attention to her suffering when she was looking for a job. It can be very frustrating to not get a job when you are qualified. Um, in biomedical sciences, people probably do eight years of postdoc before they get a, a job. So you got to make sure this is really what you want to do before going down that track. And uh, sorry about this. there are other tracks. I think we know this in animal science because so many people end up in jobs in industry that don't involve research or they end up in jobs in extension. So when you're in grad school, I mean, I'd encourage you to do like this woman says on Twitter. She says, I'm happy to help anyone transition to industry. I can give you advice and I can check your resume, but what I can't do is figure out what you wanna do and look for jobs for you. So you have to do that. So I just encourage everybody who's in grad school to uh, not only learn to be a good scientist, but ask themselves, what is really their passion that they wanna spend the rest of their life or a big part of their life um, focusing on? Should you go to grad school or we test, true or false, I'm a compulsive neurotic. I like my imagination crushed into dust. I enjoy being a professor's slave. My idea of a good time is using jargon and citing authorities. And you know, I think this is true, this last one. I feel a deep need to continue the process of avoiding life. <laughs> a lot of people go to grad school because they don't know what to do after they graduate with a bachelor's degree. And that's fine, but use your time in grad school to really think about it. So that's my first message to you guys. So assume that you have decided, yes, I wanna be a research scientist 
in academia. I want to develop an independent career as a scientist and do good in the world. I want to discover things that are going to be beneficial for mankind. You know, what are the characteristics of a person who develops that kind of career? There's probably lots of characteristics like I mentioned. I don't have all these characteristics, but let me just tell you some that I think are important because I think you can work on these even if you don't have them innately within you. You, know, you have to be proficient in science. That's what you're in grad school for. That's what you'll get taught. Understand the scientific method, know how to design an experiment, know the literature, know what's the up-to-date trends in science. What's the kind of science people want to see done nowadays? Because if I'm doing the kind of science they wanted to do in 1950, maybe I'm not going to be successful. So you kind of have to learn those trends. And then of course you have to be comfortable with all the technical skills in your discipline working in the lab, working with animals, doing statistics. That's what you learn in grad school, kind of in a formal way. But some of these other characteristics, I think, are also important to be a successful scientist. And, and you know, three of the most important there, being imaginative. I just showed a slide where they said, I enjoy having my imagination crushed to dust. We tend to do that in science. Attack any idea that doesn't fit within the box of our current thinking. But if you want to be a successful scientist, you have to develop your imagination because you have to think outside how everybody else is thinking. And you have to be creative. You know, one thing we do as scientists, we observe nature and then we formulate hypotheses to explain it. That's a creative process. So, you know, develop your creativity and you have to be curious. I mean, you just have to be curious. Who never goes to seminar? They're not very curious. Oh, I don't need to do that. I, I don't work in that area. I don't care about that. That's a lack of curiosity. You're gonna discover a lot of important ideas by opening your mind to things around you, asking questions. Why, why did that happen? You know, there's a famous story about Sir William Hunter who was uh, father of surgery in the 1700s in England. And he removed ovaries from a woman who had ovarian cancer and he wrote about it. And then he, at the end of his paper, he said, amazingly, the woman has never menstruated since. But he never asked himself, well, why? Why didn't she menstruate? And in fact, it was another 120 years before we figured out, well, the ovary controls menstruation. So he had it right there, but he wasn't curious about it. You have to be ambitious. You know, I think you have to want to be a successful scientist to be a successful scientist. You have to be persistent. You know, science is painful. So you have to persevere through that. I have a few more slides on these things. You have to be self-confident, you know, even if you're not. You're always going to be not, not, not. And if you really want to do science, you just have to convince yourself. I'm good enough to keep doing it. My grant's been rejected four times. I'm gonna get it funded the fifth time. You know, that's hard to do sometimes, but I think you have to develop that within yourself. You have to be goal oriented, get things done, even if they're not perfect. And you have to be collaborative. So let me expand on some of these things. A group of behavioral scientists a while ago did an analysis of creativity and they concluded that being artistic was a key to being 
among the most successful scientists in the world. So they asked the US public, and then they asked American scientists and British scientists, do you like art? Do you like music? Do you like painting? Do you like sculpture? Do you like writing poetry? So if you look, you know, on average, one out of three Americans say, I have some avocation for art. And that's about the same for scientists who are in Sigma Psi. It's a little bit higher for scientists who got inducted into the Royal Society or for scientists who got inducted into the National Academy of Science, you know, among the most successful scientists in the world. But look at the Nobel Prize winners. Just about every Nobel Prize winner. And this was um, 510 people. Just about every Nobel Prize winner had some avocation for art. I heard a guy one time talk about this. If you're a scientist, you've got to be creative, right? But you have a whole literature to help define your creativity. I wanna study what makes cows grow faster. Well, I can read what everybody else in the world did about that to help me come up with some new ideas. If you're an artist, you're gonna paint a painting. It just has to all come out of you. You can't go to the literature. How am I gonna paint this painting? You know, it, it comes out of your own creativity. So, you know, I would develop, it, I think scientists scoff at, at artists, but I would develop your artistic creativity. I keep adding extra slides here, sorry. You have to be persistent. This is another cartoon with another guardian angel. Don't be discouraged, do it over. Monitor the results for three months. Then to be sure, do it again for another three months. Record your findings, write your paper. And the devil says, fake it. <laughs> you know, you're gonna meet a lot of failure in science. It's just the nature of the beast. So find a way to overcome it. You know, that's where I think this self-confidence idea is important. Here's another tweet. I'm on a hot streak in terms of rejections, articles, conference proposals, grant applications. <laughs> but my mom says I'm good. Hoping my tenure decision breaks the streak. Right? It, it can be very, very discouraging. I know I've been there. But you just somehow have got to put up with it. Here's another one that I think is a guide to how to get over it. Another tweet. After a day of being annoyed about a grant rejection, I'm over it. And that, my friends, was the first lesson I learned as a pre-tenure professor. Never hit your sense of self-worth at anyone else's estimation. Damn, it's hard, but don't do it. Somebody says, your ideas are stupid. You're not gonna get funded. If you have belief that you're on the right track, take the advice, take the criticism, but don't give up. You know, have confidence that, you know, you too are a scientist. This is what Charles Darwin's father said about Charles Darwin. You care for nothing but shooting, dogs and rat catching, and you will be a disgrace to yourself and all your family. So, I mean, that was wrong. He had a lot of characteristics that probably made him think he wasn't gonna be a successful 19th century uh, British man, but he, you know, was probably the founder of the greatest revolution in biology, natural selection and evolution. So even if people think you don't have what it takes. You're kind of weird. If you have self-confidence, uh, you can succeed. You have to be goal-oriented. You have to get things done. Jeff Dahl is always saying, you know, the excellent is the enemy of the good. 
if you're always perfecting, if you're never satisfied, you'll never get anything done. And in and science, you got to get things done. You got to write the grant. You got to write the paper. So you know, be goal oriented. I don't know if you've ever read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Doug Adams, but he had a second book, The Salmon of Doubt. And in the second book, he said, I love deadlines. I love the whooshing noise they make as they go by. Well, he died before he published this book. You know, he never got it done. So after he was dead, they found the notes for the book and uh, published it. And one of my heroes is Leonardo da Vinci, you know, for his curiosity, his imagination, a great procrastinator. He lived to be in his 60s, he painted 15 paintings. He never finished them. He had dukes and marquises in Italy constantly chasing after him to finish something he started and lost interest in and uh, never finished. You know, one of his most famous paintings is this Virgin of the Rocks. It took him 10 years to paint it. So, I mean, he was uh, a genius. So his uh, reputation was guaranteed. But while alive, you know, he was a great failure at most everything he did because he never finished it. Wrote a book on anatomy, never finished it. So, you know, there's lots of characteristics of scientists, good scientists. So, I mean, you know, like how persistent am I? I'm persistent. How creative am I? I'm probably not the most creative. So how can I get more creative? How can I get more emancipative? How can I, you know, be more collaborative? I think like everything else in human activity by practicing, you know, practice science. Think about it, you do an experiment with cows, it might take a year or two to do. So over the course of 20 years, you're not gonna do a lot of experiments, but you can practice them in your mind. Go to seminar, listen to other people's seminars, Ask yourself, is that the hypothesis I would create? Is that the experimental design I would do? Is that what I would measure? So now you're practicing doing science, but not actually having to spend two or three years doing the experiment. You know, as much as you can, immerse yourself in the doing of science or participating in things that other people are doing uh, just to practice. Another thing I do, let's see, I have lost my way. I, I learn from others. I, you know, I observe Chuck Graves and I observe Phil Jacques and I observe Ed Hauser and I said, you know, what about them should I do? And what about them should I avoid? I'm always doing that. You know, you know, you should do that. Look around you. Who is successful? Who is not successful? Or what are people doing that's successful? And, you know, everybody's got a different personality. Like maybe so-and-so was successful because he beat his students to death. Well, I'm not going to do that. So I'm not going to follow that approach. But, you know, find approaches you think will work for you that you see other people doing. and and incorporate them into your own science. And you know, this includes not just people around you, but like I say, the dead. You know, read about scientists. You know, why was Louis Pasteur successful? What did he do right? What did he do wrong? He was a control freak. He never let anybody in his lab know what was going on. Only he knew. So I wouldn't like that. But you know, look at other people and, and find traits that you can incorporate. This guy, Jack Gorski, he's one of my role models. He became very famous in the 1970s 
because he discovered how estrogen works. He discovered that estrogen binds to a receptor in the cell. Before then, everybody thought, no, estrogen just speeds up enzymes somehow. But he showed, no, there's a receptor there and it binds estrogen. It goes into the nucleus and it turns on genes. And he became world famous for this. And I took a class from him and you know, he presented this model that made him such a world famous scientist. And he said, you know, the one thing that troubles me is when we crack open a cell, not only is like the estrogen receptor in the cytoplasm, all the nuclear proteins are in the cytoplasm. So maybe the estrogen receptor is not really in the cytoplasm, maybe it's in the nucleus. So even though he built his whole career on this idea, he questioned it. He questioned himself because he was trying to get to the truth, not just build himself up, you know, as the most famous steroid biochemist in the world, but he wanted to know what was really going on. So, sorry about this Zoom people. So he developed a new approach and he found out, well, actually the estrogen receptor is always in the nucleus. And my thoughts were correct. All my previous experiments were based on an artifact. You know, I really admire that. Somebody who's not afraid to challenge themselves when everybody says they're right. And after he published the paper, nobody believed them for a long time. So, you know, I think role models are pretty important. Read, 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 read. I'm sure your mother told you to read. I'm sure your kindergarten teacher told you to read. But reading is a way of building your curiosity and exposing you to ideas that you might not otherwise be exposed to. And the same goes with seminar. You might say, oh, meat science seminar. I don't care about meat science. I'm a steroid biochemist. But you'll be surprised how many times you go to a seminar and hear something that resonates with you. This is Sir Francis Bacon. He is the founder of the scientific method and probably died in the service of meat science. Because he got this idea, I think if I take a chicken and put it in the snow, we can preserve the meat and eat it later. And so he went outside and he got pneumonia and he died. So he died for science. <laughs> You know, this is, uh, I got lots of pieces of advice for people. So this is one that just came up while I was uh, preparing this seminar. Work on important problems. Don't get in a rut. If you're working on the same topic you worked on in grad school when you're 50, maybe that's good, but probably you just ran out of ideas and are just going through the motions. You know, work on important topics. And sometimes what used to be important becomes unimportant. And there's still a lot of very interesting questions that you want to answer about this area, but nobody else cares anymore. And they're not going to fund you. So here's like, I'm your guardian angel. I think it's time you knew for the past 37 years, you've been barking up the wrong trees. Okay, I'm gonna end this talk with some ideas from another scientist more successful than me, James Watson. You guys know James Watson? Watson and Crick, structure of DNA. That's, that's James Watson back in the 50s. He's from Chicago, where, where I'm from. He was like a wunderkind when he was young got on TV as like one of the future scientists of America. And then he went to Cambridge and worked with Francis Crick on the development of the structure of DNA. And 
Yeah, he wrote a book about the adventure of being the first to discover the structure of DNA, kind of an arrogant guy. Um, but um, he's still alive. He was at Harvard for a long time. So in 1993, he wrote a like a two page paper for in science, reflections. I didn't get that word from this, from this uh, paper, but succeeding in science, some rules of thumb. So you can read this for yourself, but he had like four big messages. Learn from the winners, take risks, have a fallback, have fun, and stay connected. So let me just read some of what he wrote here. So it's gonna be tricky. Learn from the winners. The fact is you must always turn to people who are brighter than yourself to get somewhere beyond your ability and come out on top. So that was written by a guy who from a young age was recognized as a genius, but he still thought for him to be as successful as possible, he had to expose himself to people who were smarter than him, who would challenge him intellectually. Let's see. Take risks. This is a hard one, to be honest with you, at least for me. I wanna do science that I know is gonna work. But he says to, take, to make a huge success, a scientist has to be prepared to get into deep trouble. If you're gonna make a big jump in science, you're gonna be unqualified to succeed by definition. So take risks. I would say when you're trying to get tenure, don't take too many risks because you have to succeed. I didn't have that problem. And then he also says, have a fallback. Be sure you always have someone up your sleeve who will save you when you find yourself in deep trouble. And that's how I kind of approach my own science. I try to do some things that I think are risky may or may not work. If they work, it'll be great. But I also do things that I know will work. And I will you know, make progress, I will get papers. My students will graduate no matter what happens. So let me give you a couple more Jim Watson-isms. Never do anything that bores you. I'm not good enough to do well something I dislike. I think that is true. So that just goes in general with, you know, do I want to be a research scientist? But even if you say, yes, I really do want to be a research scientist, work in an area that you personally find interesting, that makes you want to get up in the morning and do it. And then this is me, not Jim Watson. Make sure what interests you doesn't bore others. This is a real problem when you transition from graduate school to independent position. You gotta make sure you're working in an area that other people care what the answer is. Now, maybe you are so visionary, nobody else gets it, but you do. But still, you need to get funded. You know, it's not like the old days for Francis Bacon, who was independently wealthy, funded his own science. You have to convince somebody to give you money. So it should be something that other people are excited about. And how do you find that out? You know, by going to seminars, by reading papers, by listening to what others are doing. Okay, let's see. I got more. I think this one is so important. Constantly exposing your ideas to informed criticism is very important. 
And I would venture to say that one of the reasons both of our chief competitors failed to reach the double helix before us was that each was effectively very isolated. Rosalind Franklin, who probably would have won the Nobel Prize with Watson and Crick, except she died. Rosalind Franklin found small talk awkward. And then there's Linus Pauling, who actually won two Nobel Prizes, but not for uh, the double helix. Linus's fame had gotten him into a position where everyone was afraid to disagree with him. The only person he could freely talk to was his wife, who reinforced his ego, which isn't what you need in this life. I mean, this is going to surprise you because as grad students, everybody criticizes you. As you move up, people still criticize you, but not to your face, right? They don't want to offend a big professor. But when he's gone, they go like, oh, I can't believe. <laughs> and that really hurts you. You need, to, you need to expose yourself to criticism. It hurts. But, you know, you need to get that feedback from other people as to your ideas. This is a draft of a grant that I was involved with. So this grant got funded. But look at all the comments from people in one of them. <laughs> You know, criticizing just about every sentence that, that was being written. That's what you need. You don't have to accept all the criticism, but you need to hear it. And so then this is the other, the last point that Jim Watson made, which is also something I believe in. It's hard to succeed in science if you don't want to be with other scientists. You have to go to key meetings where you may spot key facts that would have escaped you. And you have to chat with your competitors, even if you find them objectionable. So my final rule is if you can't be with your real peers, get out of science. When I was at Wisconsin, Ali Ginther was a world famous, he's still alive and still working, world famous equine reproductive physiologist. But he told me, I don't want any of my ideas contaminated with other people's views. So I never go to a meeting. I want to know every idea is my own. But you know, he lost so much by doing that. This is a picture I took at a symposium we had in January at uh, here on campus, reproduction in the swamp. And I just took this picture. So here's a group of scientists. They spent two days together going to seminars, but also talking to each other. And here we are at the end of the night, and there's the telling me it's time to go. And oh my God, here it again. Okay. Here we are, reproduction in the swamp. End of the night, everybody's getting ready to go home. And there's Jose Santos and Angela Donella Diaz talking about science. Right? They don't necessarily work together, but they're sharing ideas with each other. Probably both of them are the better for it. And then here's another group of scientists here. I'm gonna assume they're talking about science and not like, how much longer do we need to be here? So the last point I'm gonna make, yeah, I love science. I mean, I really do love it. And it is hard and it is painful. So celebrate your victories. You know, no matter how small they are, they don't come by enough. So, you know, celebrate. You get a new result, you get a new paper, somebody gets their degree. Any chance you can, I think it's important to, you know, recognize how lucky we are to be getting paid to you know, be scientists. So whenever you can, celebrate and enjoy yourself. Mario Benelli organized the Reproduction Festival as part of the Reproductive Biology Seminar where students presented some of their work in 15 minute uh, talks and then we kind of congratulated them. It was a great idea. So that is my presentation. I think we have five minutes. 
because there's a class in here, but I'll be glad to take any comments or any questions. You know, getting back to what I said at the beginning, there is a perception in academia, you know, researchers are on top, they're the glory guys, everybody else is somewhere below. That's not true. You have to do what you want to do. I, I have a neighbor, his son got a PhD in linguistic anthropology. So he spent 10 years studying linguistic anthropology and has really come to hate academia and you know, has very little prospects of, of getting a job. He just got hired uh, by uh, Chase Bank as a researcher, probably making about three times what I'm making. And, and he's very happy. You know, he's using all his analytical and research skills in a way he had never envisioned when, when he decided to study linguistic anthropology. So there's lots of careers that are, you know, right for you. That, um, so you just got to go find them. And it, and it could be science. I'm not saying don't do science. It could be research science. But just don't be constrained by what your major professor says or what your colleague says. You know, do what you want to do. Okay. Uh, how should we perceive holy religion? Is it like I used to go to Payne's Prairie. <laughs> I look, I'm not kidding. And I would look out there and I'd be feeling pretty bad. And then after a while, you know, I'd get over it. So, I mean, it is hard to do. Um, you know, you need some, I don't know. I, I say you need support from your friends. Like that doesn't work for me. That pisses me off, actually. Oh, don't worry, you'll get fun the next time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's got to, for me, it's got to be within me. And some of it takes time, right? It, it, if you have a big blow, it, it doesn't take like the one guy said, well, the next day I'm over. It, it takes a while. <laughs> Good question, bad answer. Yep. So one of the things my major professor used to do when we were grad students was ask us how we would be mentored. So even before I was a PhD, I was thinking about how would I, you know, how would I run my lab? How would I motivate my students? And then when I became one, like I really fell flat on my face, to be honest with you, because I thought everybody's like me. So they're going to have the same motivation as me, just like me. And it took me a while to realize, no, everybody's different. And You know, it's a synergistic relationship, but you could say it's also kind of like a host parasite relationship that I'm not gonna succeed unless my grad students do a lot of work. And if I'm a grad student, I'm not gonna succeed unless my major professor gives me all the tools and to succeed and the encouragement to succeed. But on the other hand, I mean, you, you have to work together or if you're a professor, you'll crush your students. And, you know, some scientists decide that's okay. I don't care. I'm doing good. So I would say, you know, if you guys are already in grad school, but find out, you know, what is the culture like in that lab? And is that a culture you're happy with? And, and, you know, everybody's different in terms of what they want, in terms of uh, nurturing and criticism. And, but, you know, talk to the other people in the land and 
like when I did my postdoc, my postdoc advisor was very hands off, which I love because I didn't want anybody to tell me what to do at that point. But if I was his grad student, I would have been lost. So, you know, I think that's the one thing you can do, try to find out what the environment's like. If you're a mentor, you, you know, you have an obligation to your students. So, I mean, I remember one time I had a grad student come and his parents came and said, Dr. Hanson, we trust you to take good care of our son. I thought like, whoa, that's right. You know, they, this guy's put his whole life in my hands, so I better make sure I don't screw it up. You know, some people don't care about it. Yeah, too bad. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think you should be that way. You should take it responsibly. And as a grad student, you know, you should realize, I mean, I don't think a professor should ever say, you know, you need to come in Sunday. I got to get tenure. Because the student's not here, so you can get tenure. Students here, so they can advance in their life. So I never motivate my students by saying, I really need tenure or I need a promotion, you gotta work harder. That's not their business. Um, so I mean, empathy and um, patience on both sides. If you're in a bad situation, which some people are, you know, it's just, it's a, either, either party could be in a bad situation. Obviously a faculty member has a lot more power um, you know, try to resolve it with your mentor. If that doesn't work, talk to people on your committee that you can talk to. You know, if that doesn't work, you might have to talk to the chairman. Um, I've seen some students in like horrible situations. You know, I, we, we had a, I, I was just telling a student today, I saw this student at a bar, I said, hey, how's your program coming? He goes, well, I'm waiting for my major professor to read my thesis. I said, well, how long has he had it? A year. You know, that's, we shouldn't wait a year. We should find a way to get it resolved. What else? Yeah, it, so I like Twitter, right? You saw I have, there are, there are little, little channels like PhD life, academic life, academic chatter. There's a lot of angst, a lot of concern about that. You know, how, how do I be a good parent and also, you know, be a productive faculty member? And at the one hand, you've got to figure out what's right for you. You know, they used to say to women, like, you can have it all, baby. You can run GM, have 10 kids. And... No, you can't. So maybe the rare person can, but you got to balance it. So what's more important for you? And, um, you know, a lot of professors end up divorced because it puts a lot of pressure on their family life. So, I mean, just me personally, I tried to maintain, you know, I thought about it and tried to structure my week so that I was always home. Except maybe my wife wouldn't agree with me on that because I went to meetings and other things. But yeah, it, it's something that you have to balance. And then how important is being a world famous scientist versus being a good spouse or a, a good parent to your children? You've got to balance that for yourself. You know, the one thing about industry in general, they don't work as hard. They don't, you know, academia is weird, right? We don't pay much, but we think, and I'm probably one of those, you should be working every minute of, of your life. And um, 
there's a lot of professions not like me. Most guys at Joetis, they leave at five o'clock and that's it till the next morning. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry about the slides. I don't quite know what I did wrong, but I know I did it wrong. Thank you, Dr. Thanser. Okay, sorry.